Right, hello. Um, my name is Oliver Weeks. I am the curator of Earth Sciences here at the Yorkshire Natural History Museum. Um, I'm a paleontologist. I have a master's degree in paleontology and evolution from the University of Bristol. And um, my master's project was actually um, related to the evolution of whales, but I'm not really going to be talking about the, uh, my master's project today. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, let's have a look at um, what are whales? So defining terms a little bit. So when I say whales um, in this lecture, I'm going to be talking about anything that has the name uh, whale. So like blue whales, um, sperm whales, grey whales, um, killer whales, things like that, even though killer whales are technically dolphins. Um, but I'm also including dolphins and porpoises in this. So that entire group of um, uh, or all cold whales. Uh, I might also use the word cetaceans as well, and that is technically the uh, scientific word for whales. Um, and then a couple of little facts there, there's 94 living species, and many more that are extinct, and um, they're the largest animals that have ever lived, um, even bigger than any of the dinosaurs. So um, where do whales fit in with the uh, animal family tree. So they are mammals, um, but they are most closely related within the mammals to things like deer, um, sheep, cows, and camels and, and giraffes. But their closest living relatives are actually the hippopotamuses. Um, but it is kind of a bit of a coincidence that they are both live in water a lot of the time. Um, they evolved that ecology separately. Um, so when we're looking at the the fossil record, um, and we're looking at the ancestors of whales, we're going to be looking for something that looks a little bit like a deer, but also with some key features that we recognize in whales today. Um, but before that, we're just going to have a little tangent onto how we know that something used to live on land and has gone back into the water. Um, so I'm going to use the example of um, early fish evolution here, and um, we're talking about how, tetra how to tell that a tetrapod, um, how, this, how to tell that something is a tetrapod, and used to live on land has gone, in, gone into water. Um, and, well, <laughs> we're going to use, a, I get a hand from uh, our volunteer, Mr. Bones. Um, so, if we look here at the bottom of um, this diagram at the end, uh, we've got the zebrafish, and those have kind of ray-like uh, fins. And the bones don't look anything like the bones in our uh, limbs today. Um, and, but if you look a little bit further along this evolutionary tree here, you see that you're getting slightly more fleshy fins that have more um, larger bones in them. And you see that red bone at the back there is broadly the same kind of bone as this bone here, the humerus bone. And then you can see the yellow bones here, got the radius and ulna. And um, that gets more and more uh, obvious as you get closer to uh, modern tetrapods. Um, you also have the, the fingers that develop uh, more obviously into, well, fingers. Um, as you get to Acanthostega. Um, but they kind of have eight finger bones. Um, a little bit too many, I think. Uh, but they settled eventually onto the five finger bones that we have today. I'll just hook myself on that. Um, so if you look at these um, uh, limbs here, these are all of uh, marine mammals. So we've got um, seals and sea lions, um, dugon and manatee and four different whales here. And they've got a shoulder bone included, so just ignore that top bone, but they all have um, humerus, a radius and ulna, and a bunch of kind of finger bones. Um, you can also see this in the uh, ichthyosaurs as well. 
So these are marine reptiles that were around at the same time as the dinosaurs. And um, you see the large top bone, two smaller bones, and then a bunch of fingers. They've gone a little bit crazy with their fingers uh, in uh, the ichthyosaurs. And the same is true for the plesiosaurs. These two up here as well. Um, just put this back down here. Um, and you can see some of these in our gallery next door. Uh, so this is basically to show that, like, you can tell that um, a tetrapod has returned to water. It's not a it basically it's not a fish, um, and that's how we kind of first would would realize that the whales were um, at one point living on land. Um, so let's get back to what I was saying about. Um, that's the wrong way. Um, a kind of deer-like creature with some um, whale whale features. Um, so this is what we think to be the first um, ancestral whale. It's a little guy called Indohyus. It lived in the Eocene of India, so about 50 million years ago. And it had um, denser bones than you would expect from other um, land animals that live around that time. And that means that it was very likely eating um, things from the bottom of streams and rivers. Um, it helps to um, allow animals to walk along the bottom of these uh, bodies of water. Um, they also have um, chemistry. The chemistry of their bones is consistent with something that was living in the fresh water and something that was eating um uh vegetation um so it's an animal that's already going into a sort of aquatic environment um but it doesn't look very much like a whale at this point it's looking very much like um almost like a, a ratty beaver type thing but you can see at the bottom the key feature that marks this as an ancestral whale is what we call what is here the involucrum of the tympanic buller and what, it, what that is, is a thickening of um, bone around the inner ear, which is very typical of whales. I've got an example here. This is from a, um, another ancient whale, not quite as old as this, about 15 million years old. Um, it's a very strange fossil. I'll pass that around at the end. Um, and Indohyus has that. And that is the feature that really shows that this is the, the first true well, not first true whale, but the first uh, step on the uh, evolution to whales. Um, the next one is uh, Pachycetus, and it's living about the same time in the same place, and we're finding it in river deposits, so it's in this, having the same ecology it's, um, as Indohyus, and it has the same sorts of features. It's got those very deer-like um, uh, limb bones, and it, but, and it also has the um, tympanic bullet, like I mentioned, with Indohyus. However, it's got shearing teeth and it's taken on this more elongate um, structure to its skull, which is showing that it's actually changing the way that it's feeding to be a lot more like the um, uh, typical whale. Um, so after that, there is the, I'm going to, Call all these the early archaeocetes. They are, I've grouped them all in together, and I'll go on to why I grouped them in together a bit later. But they are again, a lot of them occurring in the uh, India and Pakistan at the same time, again, Eocene. Um, and there's three main groups the Ambulocetes, that's one up in this top corner, the Remington Acetes, the one that you can see in the background here. Um, and the protocetids, um, that one in the bottom corner, and there's a couple of skeletons as well of the protocetids. Um, they are, at this point, fully aquatic. They can't actually very easily go back onto land. And um, the first two groups are mostly found in rivers and coastal areas, and around India and Pakistan. There's one that's in found in Africa, but it's a little bit of a... Um, uh, an outlier, <clears throat> and that shows that those are not, they're staying to these sorts of areas where they first evolved in, and not moving out into the open oceans, but the protocetids are found worldwide, so this, 
shows that these are now starting to actually um, venture out into the open oceans. Um, maybe not quite into the fully deep waters yet, but um, they are they are marine um, animals at this point. Um, and you can see that they're getting more elongate, uh, more slender, hydrodynamic. Um, the Remington Acetids, it's speculated that um, from some of their features that it might have been um, living a little bit like otters, um, going through kind of murky waters, that the Ambulocetids are probably some sort of ambush predator with the eyes on the top of the head. Um, so got a broad mix of different um, animals evolving at the time. And the reason why I lumped them all in together is because they were all living at the same time. So if you were to look at whale evolution, how it's sort of um, depicted in diagrams a lot of the time, it's this kind of linear progress from uh, the Pachycetids through to the Basilosaurids, which we'll come on to later. But they're actually not, um, it's not a strict progression of Pachycetid to Ambulocetid to Remicinocetid. Um, evolution is more of a branching process than this, than is shown here. And um, which kind of makes sense because if you get, um, as a species, there's two different um, populations within that species. They're maybe end up in two different environments. One environment is, um, they one, one population adapts to one environment differently to the way that it would adapt to another environment. And um, you get different features evolving in each, each group. Um, and that happens over and over again. And that first group that evolved, that environment doesn't really go away. So that, um, that creature is still well adapted to that environment and will persist through, like we see up here, these sort of um, overlapping timelines here. And um, they uh, will live at the same time. And uh, this is a little bit like um, sea lions and seals today, because they evolved from the same common ancestor and to pretty similar um, conditions as well. They're both things that used to live on land and they are moving back into the water. Um, but they have different features and sea lions are actually a little bit more um, gray sail on land. Not very much, but they, they, they are a little bit better at uh, moving on land than seals are. And um, you might get from, if you just had the skeleton of a seal, you might um, think that it was more well adapted to living in, um, in, living in the water than a sea lion is. Um, but they're both living at the same time from the same common ancestors. So it's very similar to um, different things, uh, different early whales living at the same time. Um, so that's the protocytes, and you can see at the bottom, the basilosaurids are coming in. So <clears throat> this is the next group. Basilosaurids, got a little bit of a gasp there uh, because they are really, really cool. Um, they are, this is when whales get, first get huge. Um, the largest of the basilosaurids get up to about um, 20 meters long. They're getting up to somewhere in the region of 15 tons. And um, they, they start to become major players in marine ecosystems. And this is because there's a big niche that has just been um, absent of anything since the extinction of the dinosaurs. The large marine reptiles, the mosasaurs and the plesiosaurs both went extinct at the end of the age of the dinosaurs. There's been nothing around until 43-ish million years ago, um, except for sharks. And they don't really fill this like big predator niche. They're kind of um, uh, still, still the same size as sharks today, maybe a little bit smaller. Um, so the whales come in and they take over this like huge predator niche. Um, but it's not just the huge Basilosaurus. It's also things like Dorodon as well. Um, they're about the size of a modern... Um, a large modern dolphin, um, still bigger than most of the sharks as well, though. 
but they're not very ecologically diverse. They're all doing this, a similar thing. They're all um, eating um, eating their prey in the same way, which is sort of biting. And we'll get on to why that's important later. Um, they've not got echolocation yet, and they're not doing any of the things that the huge whales th today do. Um, <clears throat> so from the Eocene onwards, this is when we start to get the split of the two main groups of whales, which are the toothed whales and the baleen whales. So the toothed whales are all these ones on this side of the screen, um, including the sperm whales and the killer whales, and all the beaked whales as well. And the um, baleen whales are the huge ones over there, like the blue whale, the right whale, gray whale. Um, and they have a very diverse range of different sensory and um, dietary capabilities. For example, we have echolocation in the toothed whales, and there is um, um, uh, no, um, filter feeding in um, the baleen whales. Uh, the toothed whales also have a technique called suction feeding, and it is basically um, creating a semi vacuum in their in their uh, jaws with their jaws um, to draw in prey instead of actually actively biting the uh, the prey out of the water, and that is a, a big. They're actually using the physics of water to um, capture their prey. Um, but as you'll see later, the early baleen whales also used that um, technique. Um, they're also starting to get they get smaller again in the um, tooth whales. They get really huge as well in the uh, the baleen whales. So they've got a huge diversity of sizes as well as um, as ecologies. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the evolution. Um, we're not really going to touch much on the uh, toothed whales. There's some really cool whales, toothed whales, um, like the uh, Leviathan at the, that end. And that is um, a, a macroraptorial sperm whale. So it's a sperm whale with huge, huge teeth. And it was probably eating other whales at the time. Um, it rivaled um, Megalodon, if you've heard of Megalodon, um, <clears throat> at the same time. You also got these other types of dolphin-like creatures uh, with, with huge, long uh, snouts. Um, Squalodontids, I think they're called. And then you've got really weird ones like this. They look like walruses. Um, it's called Odobenocetops. Um, yeah, very, very strange. You'd, you'd think it was a walrus if you saw it somewhere. Um, but it's a, an odd toothed whale. But I find more interesting the evolution of uh, baleen whales. So baleen whales are some of the strangest um, animals that we've got around today. You might think, how did the, that evolution come about? So I've got a sort of simplified diagram that goes through some of the transitional um, fossils that we found. But essentially what we've got to evolve is the baleen plates, which, is, uh, which are keratinous plates made of the same thing as sort of nails and things like that that uh, sift out um, prey from the water. So they engulf huge amounts of water and then sift out the usually krill, small organisms in the water, from the water. And um, so they're able to eat huge quantities of food with uh, in one um, movement. And um, that, well, that's how they get so huge. Um, so to do that, obviously, you need the baleen plates. They also lose their teeth. And also a crazy thing that they do, that modern whales do, is they actually have their, their bottom jaws, which in us is completely um, uh, completely sealed. And in uh, modern whales, they actually have an elastic connection between the two bottom jaws, which allows them to expand the... Um, the uh, size of their, we call an oral cavity. Um, so we have to lose that connection between the bottom jaws in the evolution of whales. Um, and also obviously increase the size of the oral cavity. So as we're going through 
the evolution of uh, whales, we start to get the basilosaurus, which I've uh, covered, but coronodon and mammalodontids, they are starting to increase the volume of their oral cavity. And they're also shortening their mandibular symphysis, which is that connection at the, um, on the bottom jaws. You can see that comparing the, the jaws at the bottom there. There, I'll do a little point. Here, that area there, that's all where it would connect. And on that jaw there, and it's comparing it to that kind of orangey jaw at the back. Um, and it's very much longer in early basilos basilosaurids. <clears throat> and at this point, you've got biting still and some simple sieving, but it's possible these, uh, these early whales could have used suction feeding as well. Um, as you get onto the atiocetids, you've completely lost the connection between the bottom jaws, and it is fully elastic at this point. But we've still got teeth, um, so it is using suction feeding and probably some sim simple sieving out of um, water, um, but without any baleen plates and still with uh, teeth. So uh, later on in the evolution with Maya Bellina, they finally lose their teeth completely, and eventually with Eomysticetids, they um, gain baleen plates. Um, and finally, they're onto the uh, modern kind of ba uh, baleen whale feeding mechanism with uh, baleen filtering, baleen sieving. Um, and then we've got the modern whales here, which evolve later on uh, in some of the groups, a thing called ram feeding, which is essentially just passively moving forward with, um, with your mouth open and using that to sieve out the, um, um, the prey. In the water, and that's in things like bow, bowhead whales. Um, move on to, yeah, so it's just a little panel with um, a lot of the diversity of um, the whales at that time. Um, all of these were covered in the previous slide, I think. We've got um, Coronodon at that top corner, Mammalodon there, um, the bottom. Uh, bottom left is Clanocetus, and we've got Eomysticetus at the bottom here, which looks very much like modern whales. A little bit thinner than you'd expect, but um, basically you've got a modern whale type thing. Um, so, <clears throat> when I first did this a similar talk to this uh, last year, um, a new paper had just come out about early whale evolution with these new species, uh, Corondon planiforms and uh, Corondon uh, Newtononorum. Um, and these are the early sort of, um, maybe possibly suction feeding whales, um, which was kind of cool that it came out in the same week. But since then, we've also had the discovery of the largest of the basil Perocetus, which is that huge one at that end. Um, and that gets, could get up to about 20 meters, which is the same size as some of the other largest basilosaurs, longest basilosaurs at least. Um, but you can see the, the um, vertebrae are absolutely huge. They're like really thick. And that is uh, what we call pachyostis scler sclerosis. And that is a thickening and densening of the bones. And that is similar to what we see in manatees today. Um, which has led people to speculate that it was actually living a little bit like modern manatees. <clears throat> um, so instead of the 15 tons of um, other basilosaurus at the time, like basilosaurus, um, it's speculated that it could grow from 85 tons up to 340 tons, which, if you know how big blue whales are uh, clocking at, that is heavier than a blue whale. Uh, blue whales are between 130 and 150 uh, tons. I think that perhaps the lower estimates are probably the more accurate ones because of the structure of the bones are more like manatees. So they, when they were estimating it, they used um, manatee-like reconstructions for the 85-ton range. Um, so that would be lighter than a blue whale. But when you're comparing it to the averages of other whales at 
the round today, it'd probably be about the second or third heaviest whale of all time, um, which is crazy for something so, so early in the evolution of whales. Um, and then this one, Tutsitas, a really, really tiny whale, and it's about 2.5 meters long and 180 kilograms. So um, only as, like a heavy, as heavy as two people. And that's um, even smaller than some of its ancestors, the uh, Protocetids. Um, and you can see a comparison between the two down here. There's the huge Perocetus and the really, really tiny um, Tutsitas there. It's really cool. Um, but I think it's possibly worth saying that um, it's, it's really cool that, to live at the same time as because this might be possibly the heaviest whale to ever live. But for now, Blue Whale still holds, holds the title, officially. Um, and it's really cool to live at the same time as the, the largest animal that's ever lived. You think back and you think there's the dinosaurs, and they are oh, spectacular, they're really huge, and you think that's the time of the huge animals. But we're living at the same time as the largest animal that's ever lived, which I think is pretty cool. Um, so with that, I'll uh, end on the customary whale joke. Um, yeah, I know it's technically a fluke, but you know. Um, so yeah, got any questions?